In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the Mass of St. Raymond Nonatus. He was named Nonatus because he was not born. Uh, non natus means not born. So that's what they called him because he was taken out of his mother's womb uh, at birth. So he wasn't born the normal way. We today would really call this a cesarean section. And that's how he was born. But the name stuck with him, St. Raymond Nonatus. But I would like to focus more today on another saint of the day. And that is Blessed Juvenal Ancina. He was a bishop of Saluzzo in Italy. He lived in 1604. Um, he was born in the time of St. Pius V. And here is a little summary of his life. Blessed Juvenal Ancina. Juvenal is not juvenile, it's juvenal. J-U-V-E-N-A-L. And he died in the year 1604. But here's a little summary of his life, which uh, all, all the saints' lives are just so many reflections of God's grace, his glory, and his workings in the soul. On October 19, 1545, was born at Fossano in Piedmont in Italy, the first child of Durando and Sina of a distinguished family of Spain and his wife Lucy. The boy was baptized John Juvenal in honor of St. Juvenal of Narni, the patron of Fossano. He was a pious youth, but at first he had no intention of entering upon other than a secular career. His father proposed that he should be a physician and sent Juvenal at the age of 14 to begin his studies at the University of Montpellier. From thence he went to the school of Mondavi in Savoy and after his father's death to the, to the University of Padua. He was a brilliant student and when only about 24 years old took his doctorate both in philosophy and medicine in Turin, Italy. Here he was appointed to the chair of medicine in 1569, and he soon had an extensive private practice, especially among the poor, because he treated the poor free of charge. So here is just a devout Catholic man who grew up in a Catholic country with good Catholic popes, good Catholic bishops, good Catholic priests, monasteries, nuns everywhere. And in his lifetime, as we're going to see, he met several saints. So we would say this is the, the very, very good old days. And yet, um, he's not thinking of giving his life to God. He just wants to do God's will. But notice his acts of charity. He's treating the poor for free. And God is going to bless that, as we're going to see, because God leads him closer to a deep friendship with him. It was noticed that Blessed Juvenal never took part in the games or recreations. The only relaxations that he allowed himself were chess and the writings of verse in Latin and in Italian. He liked to deal with great affairs of church and state and publicly declaimed his own ode on the death of Saint Pope St. Pius V in 1572. So he wrote a long poem to this great Pope Saint. So remember, this is 1572 now. The England has already been shaken by Protestantism. In, in England, many priests and bishops and holy monks are being put to death. This is the earthquake hitting Europe. So this is back in <coughs> Italy. He continued to write verses and hymns all through his life and composed two epigrams on St. Thomas More. About this same year, he was assisting at a solemn mass, a requiem mass, in the church at Savigliano, where he was suddenly overwhelmed by the tremendous message of the Dies Irae. Now, this is the Dies Irae chant, and when you have a high mass for a requiem mass, 
when you have the body there and all the black vestments and the incense and the, the mournful chanting of the Dies Irae, this touched his soul. Like St. Augustine, when he heard the chants, the Holy Ghost moved his soul. And the Holy Ghost used this to draw the heart of Blessed Juvenal. And here's how it happened. He was overwhelmed by the Dies Irae. He must have heard the hymn often. And as a physician, as a doctor, he was very familiar with death. But now he realized, as never before, that after death comes the judgment. Hitherto his life had been blameless, but, but now he saw that this was not enough. God required something more of him, though what it was he did not yet know. He gave himself more than ever to prayer and meditation, trained himself in detachment from temporal things, and accepted the first opportunity that came to relinquish his post at Turin. This was when Count Frederick Madrucci, ambassador of the Duke of Savoy to the Holy See, asked him to become his personal private physician, his personal doctor. So he moved to Rome. So again, in the life of Archbishop Lefebvre, you always see how he just followed the Holy Ghost wherever he led him. Same with all, all the saints, same with Blessed Juvenal. And now he's given himself to more prayer, more meditation, and more time with the Blessed Sacrament. Of course, in those days, all the churches were traditional. They would never be heard of a, of a new Mass, and if there was, they would have quickly squelched it. And he would have spent many, many hours before the Blessed Sacrament, speaking with our Lord. And when you don't have the Blessed Sacrament in our times, send your guardian angel to where he is. To say, send him to your guardian angel to adore our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament at chapels you know that have the Blessed Sacrament and it's truly valid and present. So Blessed Juvenal arrived in Rome in 1575 and took his lodging near the church of Araceli in a spot which appealed to him because it was close to the prisons, close to the hospital, a multitude of the poor, and the prison for young criminals. His official work was not, uh, was not arduous and set himself to the serious study of theology, having for his master... St. Robert Bellarmine himself. So remember St. Robert Bellarmine, of course Rome is crawling everywhere with black robes and cassocks and habits and nuns' habits. Rome was truly the holy city in the death of a, of a, of a pope saint. And with the great victory of Lepanto that recently happened, there, there's a great electric zeal for the, for the love of Christ and the faith and uh, hearing the news of, of martyrs in England, there is a great uh, revival, we could say, with the Council of Trent that also just ended during his lifetime. So he, he's right in an interesting period of history. And St. Robert Bellarmine would have known and been the spiritual director of St. Aloysius Gonzaga. So it's very possible that Je Blessed Juvenal would have met other saints of the Jesuit order. So here he meets St. Robert Bellarmine, who's his theology professor. He became also acquainted with Don Caesar Baronius, who would, uh, Don Caesar Baronius was one of the disciples of St. Philip Neri, and would later be a bishop. He has a famous work of history, and I forget 15 something, 20 volumes, but it's all in Italian. And by Baronius, he was introduced to St. Philip Neri, and so frequented the most learned and most devout society of Rome. Thus he lived for three years, becoming ever more attracted to the formal religious life, but uncertain what definite step to take. So here's a soul that he's just following God's will. He's drawn more to the love of God. He meets St. Philip Neri, and he thinks he wants to become a Carthusian monk because he just heard of a friend lawyer who abandoned 
the life of a lawyer and entered the monastery of the Carthusians. So he thought, maybe I should do this. And he prayed and he prayed and he sought the advice of St. Philip Neri. And St. Philip Neri told him, he, he unhesitatingly dissuaded him from the Carthusian life as being unsuited to the temperament and needs of, him, of himself. And he recommended to, the, to him the newly founded congregation of the Oratory, which was St. Philip Neri's own congregation of priests. And he became an Oratorian. When Blessed Juvenal had lived four years at the Oratory, he was ordained a priest. And in 1586, he was sent to the Oratory at Naples, in Italy, the first house of his congregation to be founded outside of Rome. He was appointed to preach at once, and after a few sermons wrote to his brother about the, the goodness of these Nepo, Nepotali, Neapolitans, these Italians. He was dubbed Son of Thunder, and he also... Um, one of his most sensational conversions was that of Giovannella Sanchia. She was a singer who was known in the city as the Siren, and not solely on account of her singing. She was so touched by hearing him speak of the beauty of holiness that she made a vow never again to sing any vain, improper, or profane songs but only sacred songs. <laughs> Blessed Juvenal was very fond of music. We are told that he wished Vespers to be sung with the best music, or if that were not attainable, with Gregorian chant faultlessly executed, he said. He took up a, a great deal of care with the music at the Naples Oratory, not simply from the point of view of the decencies of Christian worship and the honor due to Almighty God, but also because he had a firm belief in its good effect on the soul. He got hold of all the latest popular songs and wrote devout words to them, whether or not to be sung in the oratory church or outside. He published a hymn book with tunes called The Temple of Harmony. So he, was, he, he saw the importance of music. And we can see that, of course, good and bad today. Good music is very available, and we need to choose to stay with good music because it does affect the soul. It does affect your person. It, it, studies even show the music a mother listens to already forms the baby, the emotions of the baby in the mother's womb already. So if the mother listens to uh, cacophonic modern rap music and garbage music, it's, it's already affecting the child's soul, believe it or not, forming his mind. So this blessed juvenile understood this, and he wanted to spread the, the good songs, good music. <laughs> He also founded a congregation of ladies, which in Italian was called the Kind Ladies. The Kind Ladies. And they were banded together to help in the hospitals and gathering material for works of charity. Um, Blessed Juvenal also took care of the poor. And in one of the ways he took care of the poor was... He, would, he told the barber, if, any, if I send any to you, cut their hair and I'll pay for them later. So he would send in these scruffy, homeless, poor people to the barber and he would give them a good shampooing and shave their beard or trim it. And it would be Father Juvenal. He told him, put it down to Father Juvenal. He would pay the bill. He, like St. Philip Neri, was also known throughout the city in Italy. And how much he was respected and loved by the whole city, he betrays himself in a letter written to St. Philip Neri when convalescent from a serious illness. 
he obediently accepted the comforts that were provided for him by his brethren. About the year 1595, when he had been in Naples nearly ten years, Blessed Juvenal was tormented on the one hand by a desire for the cloistered and contemplative life. And on the other hand, he was tempted by the sight of so much wretchedness and wickedness around him, which he could do relatively little to alleviate and reform. So what happened was a, a bishop had died. There was an opening for a bishop. And he, he knew that they were talking about him being a bishop, and he fled. He fled, and no one knew where he took off to. But he didn't want to be elected bishop. And uh, sure enough, another man was pl placed, another priest was elected and put in as a bishop. So he thought the coast was clear. In 1602, the Duke of Savoy asked Pope Clement VIII to fill two more vacant sees, bishop positions, in his realm. So you see the, 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 the good working, the good union of church and state here. This is the duke who sees his kingdom is growing. He needs two more bishops because there's two more dioceses. And he requests this of the pope. This is an example of the good, the good effects of the union of church and state that they're both concerned for the good of souls. And that's how it should be. So he asked the Pope to fill in these two par parts, these two positions for Bishop. And the Pope personally ordered Blessed Juvenal to accept the charge of to be Bishop of one of them. It is time to obey and not to fly, said the Pope to Blessed Juvenal. And on September the 1st, he was consecrated Bishop of Saluzzo by Cardinal Borges. His troubles began at once. And as a bishop, he, he uh, restored many things. He encouraged a good discipline in the monasteries. And he established for the first time in Piedmont the 40-hour devotion. Where, the, where there's adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, 40 hours straight, day and night, people are coming to pray and adore our Lord. After four months, towards the end of 1603, Blessed Juvenal set out on a visitation of his diocese. Supernatural happenings again attended his progress, especially by way of healing and prophecy. So he worked many miracles. Blessed Juvenal had at all times a disconcerting habit of correctly foretelling people's approaching death. Both before and during his visitation, he had foretold his own death. He had, he had only been back in Saluzzo a few weeks when his prophecy became true. And here's how he died. Uh, it's, and when you hear this, it's, it's history, and it just sounds like any... Uh, any, <clears throat> any um, investigation novel. There was in the town a certain friar who was carrying on an intrigue of too much familiarity with a nun. This came to the ears of Blessed Juvenal, the bishop, who reasoned gently with them both, but warned them that if their conduct was continued, he would use strong measures to stop it. So this is a duty of a bishop to correct his priests, his nuns, his faithful. And always gently at first, always try to persuade by gently reminding them and drawing them to the good. But this Franciscan priest was bad. On the feast of St. Bernard, he went to officiate for and to dine with the conventual Franciscans, it being the name day of their church, St. Bernard. And the criminal friar took the opportunity to poison the bishop's wine. Before Vespers, he was taken ill. Four days later, he had to retire to bed, and by the dawn of August 31st, Blessed Juvenal Ancina was dead. On this day, 
in 1604. He died, wrote a Carthusian monk, for virtue, he died for religion, he died for Christ, and therefore he died a martyr's death. Like St. John the Baptist, he received martyrdom as the reward of fearless speech. And miracles attended his funeral, and he would be canonized in 1869 at the First Vatican Council. So here we have a bishop who lived contemporary with many saints, many good popes. He did his duty as a bishop, and he was, he was martyred by being poisoned. And today we just, we're begging for just one bishop to do his duty. In those days, there were thousands of bishops doing their duty. In fact, it was very rare that a bishop was not doing his duty. Today, we're just begging, Blessed Mother, please hasten the hour where the Pope will consecrate Russia to put back order in this apostasy. When now we're even begging to find one bishop, especially of the bishops of tradition, to simply do their duty, simply stand in doctrine the way St. Paul and St. Timothy, the way all the saints did, the way all the martyrs did, the way Archbishop Lefebvre did. And one thing a bishop can never do is court heresy, court and uh, shake hands with or pat on the back error and heresy. A bishop can never do that. The first concern is to feed the souls with good doctrine, the whole faith. And where are these bishops today? Where are these popes to feed the flock with good doctrine? Right now we are starving. We're all like kind of orphans, starving. But do not get discouraged and do not fear. This is a, this is a time that God want us, wants us all to live. And he's going to take care of your soul. Pray to him. He will feed your soul and study and know and learn. Be zealous to know the good catechism, to know the scriptures, to know the good encyclicals of the popes, especially of Pius X and Pius IX and Pius XI on the kingship of Christ and Leo, Pope Leo XIII on the modern errors. Especially the men get to know these good encyclicals. They're not that difficult to read except maybe Pashendi. Pashendi is a real steak and potatoes. It's tough. And it takes several times to sink it in. But, and then, and then if you want a spoon-fed version of the Pope's teachings, it's Archbishop Lefebvre. Archbishop Lefebvre. And this is the great blessing we had to know this good Archbishop and to have lived during his time for most of us here. And it was very clear, his stand was very clear, very, very clear. Stay with Catholic tradition, don't seek any agreement with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. Don't go to the adult Mass, don't go to the Motu Proprio Mass, stay away from St. Peter's Masses, Institute of Christ the King, and all these groups who have, in some way, signed on with modernist Rome. And if that's what he would say about St. Peter's, sad to say, Archbishop Lefebvre would, have, would say, don't go to Bishop Fillet's conciliar SSPX masses. That's what he would say, because they have also accepted Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition, accepted the new code of canon law, accepted the new mass as legitimately promulgated, and the new sacraments, the new sacraments of the new rite. So what is all this? A lot of people hear this and they say, well, you're being too political. You're being too judgmental. And that's what Archbishop Lefebvre was accused of. But what was this good Archbishop concerned about? He was concerned about souls and the truth and the defense of the Catholic faith. That's why he said, don't go to these compromised masses because it poses a danger to the faith. And that's the way it is. 
And if there's any compromise on the faith, say all you want. It does endanger the faith. And that's why, again, we have to beg heaven, please, Blessed Mother, give us a good bishop who will just do his duty. And if it takes converting one of the four consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre or giving courage to one of them or two of them, please give them that grace to oppose this destruction of the great work of the Archbishop Lefebvre and the continuation of tradition. And if not, maybe among the bishops uh, consecrated by Bishop Williamson. But all of them also are cowing down. Every one of them is silent against the error that it's okay to go to the new mass if it nourishes your faith. This is poisonous doctrine. And if I start teaching it, you have every right to throw tomatoes and eggs at me as soon as I leave the chapel because I become salt that has lost its flavor. And, but it is affecting priests. It is affecting souls. And when they hear a bishop say, well, maybe you can go to the new mass if you, if you need grace and you find nourishment there, you're setting souls on a path to destruction. And it really is affecting souls their eternal salvation or their eternal damnation. So let's pray for all the bishops, especially the bishops of tradition, so that one of them at least will do his duty. Maybe Bishop Follet will suddenly convert and realize, I just betrayed Archbishop Lefebvre, I just betrayed our Lord, I acted like a, like a traitor all these years, now I'm going to condemn these errors. I will publicly retract the signing of the doctrinal declaration, six conditions for the agreement with Rome, and all his, all his uh, behind-the-scene meetings with the Vatican. And let's just say what they are also lies about that, lying about that. That's a fact. I wish it wasn't true, but that's a fact. So, but we must keep praying for them, keep praying for these bishops, and pray also for a pope, <laughs> a pope to do his duty. And it's hard to believe we're in a time when a pope is promoting heresy and error and leading souls to hell. It's just hard to believe. And this has been going on for 54 years. So what do we do, us Catholics scattered throughout the world? Well, Our Lady foretold all this. It's not a surprise. She warned these days would be here. The apostasy at the very top. And Archbishop Lefebvre foretold by Our Lady of Quito, he gave us the clear direction to follow. Stay with Catholic tradition. Love our Lord more than ever before. Love him for the, the, most, for the many thousands and millions who don't love him. And we Catholics got to be more faithful than ever before. And strive to keep his commandments. Try to sanctify our life. Grow in true holiness. And the love of God and the love of the Virgin Mary. Because you're meant to be the saints of these days. And you're in the making of being these saints. Right now. Through the grace of the Mass. Through the grace of hearing Catholic doctrine. And encouragement from the pulpit. From the grace of going to confession. The grace of fighting for Catholic tradition and not falling for a half compromise or full compromise or a quarter compromise. We can't do that. So stay strong in the faith, little flock here in Sparta, New Jersey. Stay strong in the faith. And, uh, and, and by the power of the rosary, whole armies have been overcome with only a few. And many great stories, many great events uh, there's the famous one, you, might, you probably know this one, in, in the Philippines. Uh, under the president, he was going to crush all these Catholic people with his tanks. And all the people, men, women, and children, were filling the streets, lying down on the streets, praying the rosary. And the tanks were coming, and the, the head sergeant, the head commander, ordered the people, get off the road. Get off the track, or I'll run you over. And they continued to just kneel and pray the rosary. And they were ready to be crushed by the tanks. And 
by the power of our Blessed Mother, the tank stopped, they turned around and never touched a single one of those Filipino Catholics. So that's the power of the rosary. It can, it can overturn this monster of modernism, strangling and suffocating our Catholic Church in a moment. So let's trust in the great power of this great weapon of our Blessed Mother, the Holy Rosary. And she will have her victory, it's foretold, but when God wants. And we want it now, obviously. We want it soon. But maybe that's not God's plan. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if it isn't, we fight on. And we continue keeping the fight of Catholic tradition, growing in holiness, the love of God, keeping the ever more devout to the Blessed Mother, and try to grow every day in a greater love of the Virgin Mary. Because she will guide you, she will lead you to the heart of her Son. And in that, we come to the Mass where you receive the heart of her Son. And may that reception of Holy Communion open to us at our death the beatific vision where we will be able through the mercy of God and our Blessed Mother, to see God face to face. Even if we have to pass through the fires of purgatory, still, Our Lady even shortens the time of purgatory for those who kept her rosary and wore her scapular. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.